Hi, everybody. I'm Sheila Paluzzi. I'll be um, facilitating the webinar today. I'm going to give a few minutes just for people to get logged on and joining the meeting, and then I can begin. And just to review, um, today's webinar is uh, regarding couples, and it's all about uh, where is the disconnect and understanding um, about disconnect um, and distance in our relationships how to identify it, and uh, how to find our way back to one another. So I see some people logging on. I'll give a couple more minutes before I get into the content, and I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. So that you can all see the slideshow. So while we're waiting for everyone else to join, I'll do a brief introduction to myself. Um, I did mention when I joined on that I'm Sheila Kluzzi. I am um, a co-director of Mental Health Foundations, and I'm also a social worker and have my own private practice here in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, uh, where I work with families, individuals, and couples. And so the content for the today is going to be all about where is the disconnect. Now, often a lot of people will have questions as the webinar goes on. And what I will do is I'll save 10 to 15 minutes uh, near the end of our webinar today, and I will answer your questions. So if you look, it should be on your screen on the bottom, I believe, middle. Um, it says Q&A. So you can type your questions into that box. And in the last 10 minutes, like I said, I'll just I'll review the questions and answer what I can in the time that we have. Um, what I also like people to know is that we do record um, these webinars. So it will be made available in video form. Um, if you're watching and maybe your partner wasn't available today and you want them to be able to watch it at another time, or if you wanted to just review it yourself. And the video will be made available on our website, um, www.mentalhealthfoundations.ca. So welcome. I believe we have most people present and accounted for. And I'm going to begin. So again, if you do miss a little piece and you're, you're logging in um, or signing in a little late, just know that this will be recorded and you can watch it at another time. So I just wanted to begin by giving credit where I believe credit is due. Um, the model of therapy that I practice when I'm working with couples is emotion-focused therapy. And Sue Johnson um, and, Bo and Les Greenberg uh, each have um, a model for working with couples in the framework of emotion-focused therapy. And Sue Johnson, uh, predominantly, she focuses on attachment, so our, our need um, for love and belonging within uh, our relationships and our primary um, adult relationships. And uh, Les Greenberg brought in um, more of the identity focus, which is our sense of acceptance and how we see ourselves within our relationships. And I'm also a huge fan um, of John and Julie Gottman. I will be introducing more of their material in the second part of this webinar where we will focus more on um, how to create that connection and that engagement. Um, but I do like to give them credit because they are infused in a lot of the work that I do. So in working with couples for emotion-focused uh, therapy, there are three phases. And you know, it's noted at the bottom, that it's not a linear process, but sometimes it helps people to get kind of an idea of um, what the process is when involved in couples therapy. Um, and just to note, I mean, this isn't obviously therapy, but to give you a little bit of an idea, um, one, on how to identify disconnect within your own relationship, and then also, you know, if you were looking to get uh, more in-depth, um, therapy that this is the process of emotion focused therapy. The one we're going to be focusing on today is identifying and de-escalating the negative interaction cycle. And I will explain that in much more detail and review what that is. And that's predominantly what the webinar of today is all about. The second phase 
is to create new ways of interaction and finding that, you know, finding our way back to one another. That's why I named the second part of the webinar in January, and I will have the date and time at the end of uh, today so that you can you know, copy that down if you were interested in the second part. But the second phase of EFT for couples is all about um, creating engagement and connection. And then the third phase is integration. So finding new ways to solve old problems. Um, and again, sometimes in couples therapy, um, you know, someone may be in phase one and then go to phase two. And, you know, it's not always a linear process where it's kind of a checklist, uh, but this just helps give a bit of an overview of the model itself. So a lot of the couples that I work with, uh, when I first meet with them, um, most of them identify some form of disconnection in their relationship as an identified problem. And when there is disconnect in a relationship, it has a huge impact, not only on the dynamics of the relationship itself, um, but on the individuals within that relationship. And one of the reasons that, you know, it's so painful uh, to be disconnected from our partners is because every single person is born with an innate need for love and belonging. So when we are not feeling that and that need isn't being met in our primary relationships as adults, it can be a very, very painful experience. Um, and one that people, you know, personally experience in different ways. Um, but either way, there's usually discomfort, pain involved in that disconnection. And, you know, throughout relationships and marriages, sometimes the, the sense of disconnection can ebb and flow. Um, most people can relate to that, you know, in the beginning of a marriage, the, they call it the honeymoon phase, where you're feeling very connected and loved and supported. And then life happens and things come up. Um, often people experience disconnect, um, you know, after children are born and they're very busy taking care of the children and all of their needs and how to manage all of that. So just want to normalize that most relationships, if not all, do experience some form of disconnection. But when it becomes a pattern, that is when um, most people will identify that it is the most painful. And so when, you know, we are disconnected, there is a likelihood that we're going to engage in negative coping strategies. And some of the common ones I've listed below. So, you know, for some people, when they're not feeling that love and belonging and connection to their partner, um, they may withdraw or isolate. So they may, you know, that might physically, you know, be withdrawing or isolating, so spending more time out of the home or, you know, maybe going downstairs and separating themselves physically from their partner. They can also be emotionally where there are some, you know, couples that I've worked with where they've described being in the same room as their partner but feeling so alone. So we can isolate and withdraw in many ways. And another one is complain or blame. So when we feel disconnected, we may, you know, have more complaints about our partner, or we might start noticing we pick on, you know, those little things like, why didn't you do this? Or why did you not pick up, you know, the groceries like you said you would? We can tend to um, blame them. So even for things that maybe they're not even connected to, we may begin blaming them for, you know, why the children are acting up or why they're you know, struggling in school or why the finances are not where they should be. Um, very, very common uh, with couples. Focusing on the negative. Um, so when we're feeling disconnection from our partner and when that pattern has been there for a while, sometimes that's all we can see is the negative, either in the other person or within the relationship. You know, the languaging of, you know, he's never there for me or she's always on my back about something and really, really struggling to see the positive. Distraction, um, you know, one of, I, I guess, today's society, common distraction. I have a lot of couples who may complain about their partner being on their phones too much or 
maybe watching television and not engaging in conversation or connection in terms of the relationship. And then planning exit strategies. Um, when some people are feeling really disconnected from their partners, they may um, start looking for houses. They may start um, researching in terms of separation agreements or just finding, you know, ways out of the relationship because disconnection can be so painful. And these are all labeled negative coping strategies, not to create blame or shame if you're doing any of these. They are actually, you know, they're more, they're ways that we try to protect ourselves. The reason why um, they're deemed negative coping strategies is that often when we respond in these ways, it actually creates more disconnection in the relationship, which is usually the opposite of what people are truly wanting, which is connection and engagement and that sense of love and belonging. And so with you know, this focus on disconnection for today's webinar, the reason why I decided to start here is because you know, in order to find our way back to one another, we first have to understand um, what's creating the disconnect and you know, how we can um, begin to understand it and also begin to interrupt it so that we can find a way um, to communicate with our partners in a more connecting and loving way and have both people's needs met. So the negative cycle is, um, I find a really, I like this visual, even though it may seem complicated as you look at it, but the negative cycle is a really great way to take a look at how disconnect is created, but also maintained and sometimes intensified within our relationships. And I like showing this too, and I, I like the reference of the negative cycle because you know when I work with couples and what I'll share with you as well, when there's disconnect in a relationship, it's, it's not, you know, it's your fault or his fault or her fault. Um, the enemy is, you know, the enemy or the problem is the negative interaction cycle. And so when we can look at it from that perspective, sometimes it can, you know, kind of give us a little bit of space to really take an objective look at it, even though it is such a personal experience when we're in it. So in this diagram, um, there are two sides, you know, partner on each side. And if you look at the top, it starts with behavior. And in the next slide, I'm gonna go over um, very specifics. But with this visual, I wanted to give the impression and just show you, you know, that um, infinity symbol in the beginning that <clears throat> there's not necessarily a start point and an end point to the negative cycle. It really is this pattern of interaction and it's a dynamic between two people um so you know if you're watching this today and maybe your partner isn't just to give you a bit of hope if you're feeling frustrated or disappointed that um within the negative cycle even by making the smallest changes as an individual it can impact um, our negative cycle in a positive way so at the top you have behaviors. So those are the actions that we, you know, literally act out in our relationships. And that could be um, criticizing. You know, if, if I'm triggered in my relationship, I may begin to criticize uh, my husband. You know, you, you don't do this enough, or you haven't done this, and you're letting me down, and you know, you say you're gonna do something and you don't. So the behavior is, you know, what the fly on the wall would see when there's an argument between you and your partner. The second piece of it is a perception and attribution. So when I, my behavior of criticizing my partner, that impacts how my partner sees himself. Um, so the criticizing, you know, he may feel judged, he may feel devalued, um, all those sorts of things. And that perception then leads to a secondary emotion. So this is where we can tend to stay stuck in our arguments. So if my husband's behavioral reaction to my criticizing is to criticize right back, then 
you know, perhaps we're both feeling devalued and unheard and unimportant and judged. And that's where we see that secondary emotion, which is often anger, frustration, and we can kind of, you know, stay stuck. That's why I think that little line is um, across the middle, because that's often where we stay stuck in our arguments, right? So then if my response is to be angry and frustrated, um, then he's going to likely, you know, pair that with anger and frustration. But when it comes to really, really wanting to get a deeper understanding of what's going on, you want to look at the primary emotion. So if I'm feeling devalued by my partner, anger may be that primary response. But deep down, I'm likely feeling hurt, sad, you know, like just um, disappointed possibly, which is a bit of anger and sadness. And when we can identify the primary emotion, then we can start to understand what the unmet attachment need is. And so I'm going to go to the next slide to show you, you know, how it kind of leads through the cycle. And again, I know I'm going through it in a bit of a linear fashion, um, but just want to emphasize that it is a repeating cycle. So I mentioned, you know, the behavior, critical, hostile, aggressive, attack, um, and that's more of a pursuer stance. So the pursue, withdraw dynamic that I have here is a common one. There are other um, common cycles within partners, but this is the one I would say I see most in my practice. So the pursuer is literally pursuing the connection, right? So how they may do that at times might be critical or hostile or you know, aggressive, um, not necessarily physically, but verbally, um, or attacking, right? And so the withdrawer, on the other hand, um, has a tendency to pull back. So when the pursuer is criticizing or attacking or judging, the withdrawer's primary instinct is to back up and to disengage and shut down. So if we look at the secondary emotions for each, the pursuer and the withdrawer, the secondary emotions for both may be rage, frustration, jealousy, anxiety, resentment. And like I said, those are often the, the emotions we see most readily in our partners when there's an argument and often um, stay stuck there. But if we look below the surface, at what the primary emotions are. So if you follow the, the arrow, um, the primary emotions for you know, the pursuer could be hurt, alone, unwanted, isolated, abandoned, unimportant, disconnected, unloved, sad, afraid. And for the withdrawer, it could be similar, but there's sometimes it's a little bit different, but the primary emotions can be rejection and inadequacy and shame, overwhelmed, numb, frozen, hopeless, unimportant, sadness, and fear. And so when we can begin to identify what those primary emotions are for ourselves and also for our partner, then we can start to really understand what they're needing when that cycle is, is looped up. So I encourage um, for this slide, so that you can do this work, like this worksheet or these questions later on, I encourage you to take either a screenshot on your computer or your phone, uh, wherever you're joining from, or um, you can take a photo, you know, with your phone. What I will try to do is add these in the link on our YouTube channel for Mental Health Foundations once the video is uploaded. But do welcome you to take a moment and, you know, just capture these questions. Because um, I know sometimes first seeing the visual of the diagram, it can feel a little overwhelming and confusing. So we're going to break it down uh, question by question in terms of, identifying what your negative cycle is in your relationship. 
So when you do this, um, it would be each person getting to give these responses. So if we go back to the slide, we behaviors are for each person, um, the emotions, the perception, um, as well as the need. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we continue. So when my partner and I are not getting along, I often react by, and those are the behaviors that were shown in the, in the visual aid in the last, uh, the previous screen. So those are the actual behaviors. You know, are, is it criticizing? Is it slamming doors? Is it um, walking away in the middle of a conversation or that withdraw um, presence? What are the behaviors that you do in an argument? My partner often reacts to me by. So when you engage in whatever behaviors that you have, what are your partner's um, reactions and response and what are their behaviors? And I will go over, if, if this is confusing as well, I will go over an example of how to put it all together as well. So the next one is, when my partner reacts this way, I often feel. And again, that can, you know, first be those primary reactions. So when my partner walks away from a conversation and an argument when we're in the middle of it and I'm trying to get my point across, I often feel it could be infuriating, you know, that primary emotion of frustrated and infuriated. But I would also encourage, you know, to kind of go a bit deeper in terms of that primary emotion because when we're trying to communicate with somebody and when we're really needing to feel understood right the primary emotion connected to that is usually around sadness or feelings of rejection or you know not being important or valued in terms of what we have to say so when looking at the i feel you know, if anger is kind of that first reaction, um, just to try to go a little bit deeper in terms of what else are you really, really feeling underneath that anger and frustration. So the next piece would be, when I feel this way, I see myself as. So when my partner walks away from me in the middle of an argument, you know, I feel angry, but also hurt and sad and devalued. And I see myself as unimportant to that person um, or as like I don't matter or that they don't love me. Maybe I'm unlovable. So it's the perception of self um, when you're feeling that way in terms of the negative interaction cycle. And when I feel this way, I long for or need. So when we're feeling sad or devalued or unimportant, what is the true need? And to give you a hint, because there are, you know, when it comes to emotions, there are specific needs for each emotion. And sadness you know, needs comfort. If the feeling is like shame, like I'm not good enough and they don't love me and I feel like I'm not worthy to be heard, the need for shame is reassurance. So what you're longing for or needing may be, <clears throat> pardon me, some sort of verbal reassurance or even physical reassurance, right? In terms of I'm just longing for or I need them to stay present physically in that argument so that we can work it out. The second or the, the next piece is when I react the way I do, I guess my partner feels. So this is essentially the expression of empathy and the practice of empathy. So if I'm a pursuer and uh, my behaviors tend to be criticizing and judging my partner, you know, how would that feel for the other person to be judged or criticized by 
you know, the person that they're hoping um, and, and at some point felt most connected to and this wanting and longing that need, that need and acceptance from. So if I'm criticizing and judging my partner, you know, they may feel devalued, ashamed, uh, like a disappointment, um, unimportant, you know, anything that the, the emotion there might be shame, but sadness maybe, right? That, you know, part of, he tries really, really, really hard to make sure that I'm happy and pleased. So when I, you know, I criticize and I judge and I blame, um, that has him feeling really sad because that's, you know, not what he was trying to do or maybe it was not the intention. So it's, it's just the practice of empathy, which is putting ourselves in the other person's shoes. This can be really difficult to do when you are in a negative cycle. So I am sitting here, you know, presenting this to you and, you know, you may be in a pretty calm position and feeling pretty relaxed, but when we're, for any of us, when we're looped up in that negative cycle of interaction, our emotions tend to be really high. And if we've been triggered, right? So if I feel like I'm not important, I'm devalued, my emotion is going to be really high and it, it makes putting ourselves in the other person's shoes really difficult. So I know I'm presenting this as, you know, kind of matter of fact and step by step, but also just, I want to normalize that, you know, putting ourselves in the other person's shoes in the midst of an argument when we're feeling hurt by them can be very difficult. So that's why, you know, sometimes the pen and paper and writing it down might feel a little disjointed or, you know, um, like too objective, but it can be a really, really good way to take a look at the negative cycle as opposed to trying to do these steps when you're already in it and your emotions already been activated. So the last one um, is we're going to put it all together to understand your negative cycle. So I use an example that can be common, but also want to invite you that Yours may look different. It's just to help kind of how to go through those steps for you. So when my partner and I are not getting along, I often react by complaining, blaming, criticizing. My partner often reacts to me by withdrawing, not talking, staying away from me, so this is kind of describing that common pursue withdraw pattern I was talking about earlier. When my partner reacts this way, I often feel hurt, sad, angry. When I feel this way, I see myself as unimportant, alone, unworthy, and when I feel this way, I long for or need reassurance that we are in it together and open communication. And so the reassurance, you know, comes from that feeling of unworthiness, the shame is the emotion connected to that. And again, um, you may have different answers for this. Just wanted to kind of break it down to give you some examples. And then so when I react the way I do, I guess my partner feels attacked, hurt, ashamed. And so here we go in one paragraph. When I complain, blame, or criticize my partner, they pull away from me and shut down. I, I guess the way I react may leave them feeling devalued, confused, and attacked. When my partner pulls away, I feel sad, hurt, and angry, and perceive myself as unimportant to my partner and all alone. When I feel this way, I need for my partner to reassure me that I matter and to talk openly with me. And so if we were to reverse it, you know, from the other perspective of more of the withdrawal, it may look like 
when I shut down, walk away, um, or pull away from my partner, they criticize, blame, um, or you know, attack, or judge me, or complain. And I guess the way that I react may leave them feeling alone, unheard, and unvalued. When my partner attacks, criticizes, blames, I feel unworthy, devalued, ashamed, angry, and I perceive myself as, may again be unimportant to my partner or not good enough or not worthy. And when I feel this way, I need for my partner to, for the withdrawer sometimes, it's like to give me a bit of space in an argument and then to re-engage later on so that I can, whatever, calm myself down um, and then be able to speak in a little bit more of a, a de-escalated space. So sometimes the withdrawer, you know, the need is a bit of space in order to reconnect. And for the pursuer, often it's, um, and I can, this is knowing laughter, I'm an identified pursuer. Um, so sometimes for the pursuer, it's like you're needing that, that constant, like that connection immediately. So sometimes for the pursuers, I've heard, you know, and probably done, um, and when the withdrawer is walking away because maybe they need a bit of space, the pursuer is like on their heels, but we need to figure this out and we need to talk this out and we need to come to a resolution. Um, deep down, what they're both needing is connection, but the pursuer goes at it from, you know, a bit more of a perceivably, you know, kind of aggressive approach. Um, and the withdrawer needs a bit more space or sometimes time to process before they can come back and reconnect. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on raw spots, which are also known as emotional triggers. You may have heard these phrases before. But why they're so important, um, especially in terms of you know, relationships and the negative interaction cycle is usually when either person is triggered, that's, you know, um, can loop into um, the interaction site, the negative interaction cycle, or within an argument, um, we can get triggered and our raw spots can, you know, kind of take a hit. So what are they? Um, you know, kind of put in a nutshell, if you can think of a time, you know, in an argument with your loved one where it almost felt like sometimes you physically feel when you've been triggered. You know, it's almost like it feels like a bit of a punch in the gut, like what people explain it as. Or when you notice yourself or think afterwards, you know, wow, like I, I really overreacted to what the situation called for. So an example might be, um, you know, partner comes home, <clears throat> pardon me, five minutes late because uh, bad weather. And then, you know, if that's a raw spot, the emotional reaction might have been, where were you? I don't trust you. I don't believe what you say. You know, it might be a really, really, really intense emotional reaction. When that happens, usually it's because we're triggered. Or you may have noticed, you know, with your partner, you might say something and have the full intention of um, not hurting them and not wanting to insult them. But their response is this really intense emotional reaction. Um, or for the withdrawer, sometimes it's like a complete shutdown. That usually is an identifier that there's um, been an emotional trigger or like a raw spot's been hit. We all have them um, and we'll, you know, encourage, I'll talk about some common triggers, but encourage, you know, even in this moment or after this webinar, just to reflect a little bit on, you know, what your raw spots may be and what might help you identify that is learning about where they come from. Um, so what I often share with people, you know, even though in our Partner relationships, our partners do trigger these raw spots. They're, these raw spots are created um, throughout childhood. 
And that's not to say, you know, you didn't have wonderful parents and it's not, you know, kind of this blame game. But our emotional triggers come from unmet needs in our childhood. So if um, a man grew up in a home where, you know, there was a lot of um, judgment or criticism or even just a complete lack of praise, uh, they might have the raw spot of that judgment or criticism, right? So anytime they feel as though their loved one is, you know, judging them or criticizing them, that that's when they might feel that really visceral emotional reaction and, you know, either say things they don't mean or go on the attack or, you know, go on the complete defense and shut down and put the wall up and like completely disengage from whatever the conversation is. So again, we all have them. And even if we had some really great um, parents, often there were unmet needs that we experienced because there's no perfect parent. Uh, so I encourage you just to take a moment, you know, and think about you know, what, what is my emotional trigger? And maybe what were things that, you know, it's really painful when you were younger. For some people, you know, it's a specific judgment around, um, you know, I always grew up not feeling smart enough. And so anytime my partner kind of, whether they intend to or not, but anytime my partner even, you know, hints or I perceive them as, you know, thinking I'm less intelligent or stupid, whew, that's when I either go on the attack or the complete defense. So how do they impact our relationships? Well, I'm sure you have kind of an inkling now when we have those intense emotional triggers, we are often, you know, it's, it's a reaction, not a response. Some people described me, you know, that, that phrase, like I just see red and there's almost not this logical ability to hear what the partner's saying. It's almost like once that trigger is, there and it's you know the, the target's been hit it's really difficult for us to then even hear what our partner's saying and sometimes it's difficult for us to even communicate what we're really intending to communicate and part of this reason from an emotional perspective is for any of us when we experience a very intense emotion it decreases our ability to engage you know this part of our brain which is our logic and rationale and problem solving so when we're in an emotional trigger, it really does kind of rob us of our ability to be objective. Um, it makes it more difficult to empathize or really even care where the other person's coming from because we just feel so hurt or so wounded in that moment that we're just going on that innate, you know, reactive defense or um, attack in order to, you know, kind of protect ourselves. So they impact our relationship because not only do they continue, you know, keeping that negative interaction cycle in place? Um, it often can intensify it, right? So if every time there's a trigger, there's that, you know, either attack or kind of defense uh, reaction, it makes it really, really difficult for either person to feel hurt, right? Especially if how we react triggers our partner and then both people are triggered and, you know, the, that top part of the, the cycle where you kind of stay locked into those um, primary emotions, right? So it can have a significant impact. And, you know, from a more positive perspective, when we can understand what our emotional triggers are and identify where they came from for ourselves, and then in turn understand our partners, it's, it's a start a starting point to be able to um, de-escalate that negative interaction cycle so that it's no longer, you know, she is just nagging me all the time and doesn't care about what I think. And he's always um, leaving me and I'm not even important to him. It allows us to have a bit of a deeper conversation in terms of, okay, he gets really triggered. You know, if, if he perceives that I'm in, like implying in any way that he's stupid, 
and I get really triggered if uh, I perceive him to be rejecting me because those come from you know the past it can create a deeper conversation and a deeper understanding for ourselves and for our partners and it also begins to create that space for finding another way to communicate and connect in a manner that allows us to have our deeper emotional needs met so those primary emotion needs because rejection is very painful you know to feel like you're being rejected and in order to meet that need you know of, of connection and reassurance we have to get to that deeper level below those raw spots um, and be able to identify even for ourselves what our need is so I talked a little bit about some of these already, but common triggers, um, you know, for people are rejection. And this is um, from our perception, right? So if I'm talking about my raw spots and mine is rejection, anything that I perceive as rejection is going to hit that raw spot. So even if my partner said, um, yeah, but, but I didn't reject you. I just told you I was, going out um, for the evening with the boys. It, it, we can argue that point back and forth, but if I perceive it as rejection, that is going to be my true emotional um, reaction, if that's the raw spot. Um, judgment and criticism. So again, sometimes partners, and I've seen it even unfold in a couple sessions where one partner may be communicating how they feel and it lands as pure judgment and criticism for the other person. And then their, you know, whatever their reaction is in terms of their emotional trigger, you know, starts to kind of present itself. And in terms of the judgment and criticism for a raw spot for some people, it's specific. I mentioned the one earlier of feeling stupid. Um, for other people, you know, judgment of, I know for a lot of women, um, and just in the research of shame, for women, there's really high expectations, right, in terms of what we have on ourselves. And often it's, you know, do it all, do it well, and do it with a smile. And if we fail to meet any of those very really high expectations, the feeling of shame comes in. So for you know, some of um, the couples that I've worked with, women have identified, you know, when he makes a comment that, you know, somehow I let something slip. You know, I forgot to bring the kids lunch or pack the kids lunch. So I had to rush or he had to rush to bring it to school. Um, that can be a big trigger, right? Like it could be um, like just feeling like not measuring up. And again, it's a, it's a perception thing. So the husband may say, I'm not judging you for forgetting the lunches. I was just, you know, a little stressed out because I didn't have time and I didn't plan to do it. For the wife, you know, maybe a huge emotional trigger and it's like, I'm not good enough. I can't keep up. I'm not managing. I fail. Um, so very much it's about our perspective and our perceptions. Abandonment um, can be a big one for a lot of people. And even if, you know, in your childhood, you didn't experience at like an outright abandonment of one parent or another. Um, but some people have the experience of feeling very alone when they were a child. And the, that's a, a very painful place for them to, you know, a very painful experience for them to have. So when they feel as though their partner is, you know, walking out on them or not there for them, it triggers this really painful experience of abandonment. And aggression. This is a common one uh, I've seen as well where, you know, in the face of, um, and again, it's, it doesn't have to be physical aggression, but it's for some couples, like even in the face of loud um, yelling, right? Whether you know, partner may just be trying to get a point across, right? I'm not necessarily speaking about verbal abuse um, or anything cruel. But in argument, sometimes partners will raise their voice, and that's a huge trigger um, for some people. And again, it usually links back to childhood, right? And some of the common things around aggression. Um, 
that I've heard is either, you know, I grew up in a household where there was just so much yelling. So anytime my partner raises their voice, I just feel myself, you know, completely shut down and go numb. Or it might be the opposite. I feel myself just wanting to attack and, and defend myself and kind of, you know, protect myself and that conversation or that interaction. And then I've also heard the opposite where um, someone has grown up in a household where there was no yelling at all. And so when their partner raises their voice, for them, it triggers, you know, this has got to be horrible. You know, maybe um, they're leaving or, you know, because I don't know, this isn't familiar to me. I'm not familiar with, you know, raising voices and, and arguments and working through things. For some partners, it just triggers this fear of, um, you know, it, it, this is really bad, you know, and what if he or she leaves me? So aggression can be a common trigger as well. There are other ones. So if there's, you know, if you didn't connect or relate to any of these, um, again, just invite you to reflect afterwards on, you know, what are the behaviors that your partner does that you notice you have that really visceral, um, intense response to a reaction to. And from there, you know, if you can identify, okay, well, when my partner judges me um, or calls, implies that I'm stupid, that's a really, really big um, trigger for me. And I go right into, you know, defense or attack and I sometimes can't think straight and I don't even remember what I wanted to say in the first place. So once, um, you know, you can identify what the behavior is that triggers it, you can start to connect to for yourself, okay, what is that triggering within me? You know, is it that criticism and not feeling good enough? Is it the rejection or abandonment? Or is it, you know, just the fact that he or she raises their voice? Um, I just get that, that, you know, that visceral reaction I feel triggered by. So this can be um, a way to begin to de-escalate your negative interaction cycle with your partner. Again, whether they're watching with you or not today. So one of the first things is, as cheesy as it sounds, but name it to tame it. <laughs> Once we can identify what our trigger is, then we will be more apt to notice it when it happens. So if I notice that my trigger is um, rejection. When I feel as though I'm being rejected by my partner, it creates this very painful emotional experience for me and I respond by shutting down. Once we can understand it for ourselves, then when it's happening, we can be more likely to notice it and, and you know, either interrupt it or like call a timeout, but it, to name it to team it helps us um, to understand ourselves a bit deeper. And also, as soon as we you know, name it, we've engaged this part of our brain and it can help a bit to regulate the emotional response that's coming. The next one is, once you've identified it, to breathe. <laughs> um, Many reasons why I encourage this, but the number one reason is what we want to try to begin to do is to regulate that intense emotional reaction. Okay? We don't want to ignore how we feel. We don't want to, pardon me, disown our feelings or shut it down. But because, you know, it's connected to a past wound, that's why it's so intense. So we do want to try to find a way to regulate it so that we can you know, communicate in a more authentic way uh, and respond to our partners as opposed to reacting to the trigger. So taking 10 deep breaths um, in through the nose, filling the lungs and the belly, out through the mouth. What this does is helps to regulate our nervous system. So it will help to calm that emotion. Like I said, we're not looking to get rid of it. Um, I'm not encouraging that at all, but just how to kind of bring it down enough 
where we can respond as opposed to react. So this may mean taking a you know, time out, like I need a break, I know I've been triggered, I need five minutes to just go calm down. And then you may go somewhere alone, take some deep breaths, um, and just to help to regulate the nervous system. And then I do encourage re-engaging at some point. When you're in that space of breathing, to ask yourself what you're truly needing from your partner in that moment. So going back to that cycle, you know, am I needing reassurance? Am I needing just physical um, closeness so that we can talk through this? Am I needing um, just a bit more space so I can, you know, calm down and then we can, you know, re-engage and try to find our way through this argument. And then <clears throat> the very vulnerable part but helpful is expressing that need to a partner. So a quick rundown. An example, I'm livid with my partner for not doing what I asked, brackets, a million times. So name it. This is the trigger for me because when it happens, I feel unheard, unimportant, and devalued. I react with anger, but I'm really feeling sad and hurt. Ten deep breaths. Okay, what I'm needing is my partner to understand how important it is for me to be acknowledged. A lot of times in couples, they're not needing to be right. That's how it feels in the argument, but they're needing to feel understood. That's what creates connection. When we feel like our partner sees us and understands where we're coming from, even if they're not agreeing with our stance. And then to communicate that. I feel undervalued and really sad when I feel like what I ask of you is dismissed or removed. Now we're beginning to find another way to communicate that really gets to what the underlying need is. And that is where we find the connection in our relationships. So we want to use this information in terms of, okay, how do we increase meaningful connection? So what I will encourage you to do is to write out your negative cycle with your partner, ideally. So you can both understand what it is and then recognize when it's happening. Know your triggers as you, you, know, as you go into it. Know your triggers and raw spots. Understand your partner's triggers and raw spots so that you might come at it from a different approach. Um, and interrupt the cycle when you notice it happening. I had one couple, I thought it was hilarious and fantastic. When they were just first beginning, you know, couples therapy, they decided they were gonna literally like wave the white flag when one of them recognized they were in the negative cycle and that they would, they would take a time out at that point and come back to, you know, reconnect or whatever we discussed. They would literally grab a white towel, throw it in the air. That was the sign of, okay, we're in it. Let's stop. Because the first step is, well, to notice it, but then find a way to interrupt it. And I usually encourage, you'll see the we is capitalized. Um, it's, that's a great way to not escalate <laughs> the negative cycle. Because uh, I can imagine you can all um, visualize what it would be like if your partner said, oh, here you go again in that negative cycle. <laughs> Probably going to trigger a lot of us and escalate it. But if we use the language of, okay, here we go, here we are in the negative cycle, you know, it takes it from that kind of blaming back and forth um, interaction. And it's like, okay, no, this is what the issue is. Let's take a pause. So encouraging that new language. And then trying to express that underlying need to your partner. I feel blank sad, angry, frustrated, hurt, ashamed, when, whatever. So I feel sad when um, I, I feel like you're discounting what I say or I feel unheard. What I need from you is to give me eye contact and listen to me when I speak and give some indication that you care. Okay? So I want to give time to get to some questions. Um, but want to mention, you know, I know today we look more at the phase one of what creates disconnection in our partnerships. 
in the next one, January 9th at 6 p.m., we're going to look at deepening the connection. So a lot of couples will say, okay, well, now we know how to interrupt the negative cycle, but how do we re-engage with one another? How do we communicate with one another where we can actually meet each other's needs and feel that connection? So we're going to talk about that more in the next webinar. And then the registration for that would be the same as for here um, at www.mentalhealthfoundations.ca. So I'm going to stop the share. So there was the question of um, if the slides will be made available, what we'll be doing is I'll be making the whole video available. So not the slideshow, but so that you have the content as well as the slides. And in terms of the specific handout of understanding that negative cycle, um, I will um, try to link that to you when I put the video up so that if people want to print a copy, um, so they can complete it with their partner, they can. Um, and if not, I can, I don't know, maybe if you didn't get a photo of the, or a screenshot of those questions, I'll find a way to get it to the participants today. And okay. So there is also the question of um, how do I calm myself down when triggered? Like, are there other ways? Um, the breathing would probably be the number one where I would suggest starting. There are other ways to calm the trigger. Um, but what I would encourage too is once you can identify your trigger, to bring compassion to it. So sometimes, you know, people will share with me, um, you know, I'm just so stupid for reacting this way because, you know, I know they love me, I know they care. Um, and yet I just, I feel so hurt and rejected in this moment. It's so dumb of me. What I would encourage is once you identify what your trigger is, be compassionate. These raw spots and these emotional triggers come from deep wounds from our childhood. They're very real um, and they deserve to be uh, looked at, you know, from a place of compassion. And I also encourage, you know, to do that for your partner as well. So sometimes we may feel like, you know, no matter what I say, it sets him off or her off and ugh, like whatever. So they had critical parents when they were younger. Like I didn't create this or I didn't cause that. But I would encourage as well to bring compassion to them, right? Because again, our partners didn't ask for their emotional triggers or their wounds um, and didn't get to decide what needs got met for them in their childhood. So infusing that idea and using compassion as an anchor both for yourself and for your partner um, can really 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 help um, to also to de-escalate when in that negative interaction cycle okay i'm thinking yes our time is just about up so i want to thank everybody for joining today also welcoming you to take part in the the next webinar will look at deepening the connection and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.